Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Amanda Kramer and I am the Alumni Engagement Program Manager at the University of Colorado Boulder's LEAD School of Business. These are certainly trying times and here at CU Boulder, we have gathered our world-renowned faculty and alumni to provide frank and timely insights for life during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. Today is the sixth of eight webinars in this COVID-19 related webinar series. To view upcoming webinars, please visit our website at colorado.edu slash business slash alumni. Click the drop down arrow and click attend online webinars. For today's webinar, we're so excited to have mental health clinician, social psychologist and assistant professor at the Colorado School of Public Health, Dr. Courtney Welton Mitchell, here presenting practical strategies for supporting mental health during COVID-19. A few housekeeping items before we begin. First, if you have any questions now or during the presentation that you would like to ask Courtney, please send a question through the chat interface. We will monitor questions as they are submitted and Courtney will respond to them at the end of the presentation. As a reminder for optimum audio quality, we do have everyone on mute except for myself and our speaker. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please notify us through the chat interface and one of our support specialists will touch base. Lastly, a link to access the webinar recording will be sent to all registrants tomorrow, along with the survey link and supplemental resources from today's presentation. Now, I am excited to introduce today's speaker. Courtney Welton Mitchell is a mental health clinician and social psychologist. She is a clinical assistant professor at the Colorado School of Public Health, where she teaches several courses, including a disaster mental health course. She is also a research associate with the National Natural Hazard Center, CU Boulder. As a researcher, academic, and practitioner, Welton Mitchell has a strong record of developing research grants and humanitarian consultancies that result in evidence-based solutions to complex problems. Welcome, Courtney, and thank you so much for being here. I'm going to hand the webinar controls over to you now. Okay, well, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. We're gonna to be talking about practical strategies for supporting mental health during COVID-19. So first I'm gonna provide an overview of the content we'll be covering today. So many people are experiencing mental health difficulties associated with the pandemic. It's the case that feelings of grief and fear and anxiety appear to be increasingly common along with sleep disturbances, difficulty concentrating and more. And in addition, the so-called social distancing, which we might more appropriately refer to as physical distancing, these requirements can be emotionally challenging and potentially increase feelings of loneliness and undermine the potential for social support. But I'm hoping that today you'll see, I'm gonna emphasize that each of us can put coping strategies in place to help us manage such challenges. So during this brief webinar, we'll discuss detrimental effects of chronic stress, We'll encourage identification of coping strategies. We'll consider innovative ways to connect to and grow social support networks. And at the end, I'll provide some resources for those of you who may be interested in follow-up. I realize this is a busy slide and I don't expect you to be able to read all the details, but I just want to include this slide as a placeholder to acknowledge that those those that are in attendance on the webinar and Facebook Live and who might actually view this webinar later as well are a very heterogeneous group. And so while we're all in this together and it's important to come together and to uh, promote social cohesion and some means of feeling of social solidarity, it's also the case that everyone's coming from their own vantage point and has their own unique struggles. So I'm assuming that the audience here includes students, alumni, friends of, and others, but also among those and the larger group, we probably have people who are working from home, those who are essential workers still working, but potentially at personal risk of exposure. I assume we have healthcare workers among the group in attendance. We have those who have lost a job and are potentially experiencing financial strain, parents caring for children at all developmental levels, those caring for others, those considered in high risk groups, those who have lost a loved one, uh, those living alone, those living in crowded conditions, those living in less than ideal circumstances, those potentially struggling with pre-existing mental health or other health challenges, 
and those potentially struggling with other issues that may be exacerbated in the current crisis, including uh, stigma, racism, and other challenges. And I imagine also we have some people in attendance who may have survived COVID-19 or who may be struggling with it currently. I'm sure that there are more that I haven't mentioned, but I, again, just wanted to acknowledge the diversity here and say that you're all welcome. And I'm so grateful to be able to provide this webinar and to have such a creative, diverse, and heterogeneous group in attendance. Also to set the tone for the content I'm going to cover, I wanna just highlight a few things. One is that your feelings are valid, whatever you may be feeling. Two is that you can appreciate what you have, so you can be grateful. You can recognize the struggles of others at the same time. And despite both, you can still be sad and angry. There is so much that you can't control at the moment that none of us can control. And there's so much uncertainty. It's important to focus on what you can control to the extent possible. So let me take a minute to highlight what we know. This is some existing and emerging research on mental health in the COVID-19 pandemic. Research in the US and elsewhere indicates that the pandemic and associated stressors, for example, uh, health-related anxiety, job loss, and more, has exacerbated mental health symptoms among those with pre-existing conditions, many of those with pre-existing conditions. So for example, people who may have already been struggling with depression or anxiety, for some of them, this has worsened their struggles. And it's also resulted in new mental health challenges for others. Unfortunately, as the situation continues for the weeks and months to come, it is likely that the mental health burden will increase. We know that prolonged social isolation, uncertainty, job loss, loss of loved ones, exposure, to those who are ill and suffering, for example, I'm thinking of uh, health workers. It's also likely to have detrimental impacts, including increases in depression, anxiety, and PTSD. For some additional resources, I know some of you may be interested in looking into this work further. I provided a few links here. I also want to mention at the end of the slide, um, you can see, and again, these slides will be shared, a link the National Institute of Mental Health is actively conducting research on COVID-19 and mental health, and there are opportunities to participate in some of that research to join a study for some of those of you who may be interested. So now let's pivot a minute to thinking about stress. So stress is something that in mild to moderate amounts can actually be positive. It can make us feel energized, focused. It can result in optimal work performance. However, at higher levels of stress, and importantly, stress that is chronic, so unremitting, re relentless stress, that can be highly problematic and very detrimental. So it's important to recognize that each of us experiences stress differently and the signs and symptoms that we're aware of of stress when we individually experience it may be different than what our neighbor experiences. But I wanna just highlight a few things that you might be struggling with if you're feeling chronic stress related to the current situation. So common behavioral and physical signs of chronic stress include worry, an increase in worry, a loss of interest in things that perhaps you used to enjoy, um, a desire to withdraw from people and activities, poor concentration, confusion, forgetfulness, uncertainty or trouble making decisions, relationship conflict, feeling sad, feeling anxious, feeling irritable, getting into negative thinking patterns, and then an increase in what we might think of as maladaptive forms of coping, like excessive drinking or smoking. Physical signs can include changes in appetite, weight loss or gain, gastrointestinal problems, disturbed sleep, grinding teeth, and more. So this is something, again, these signs and symptoms of chronic stress may vary for each of us, but these are some things to consider if you're experiencing these 
it may be as a result of ongoing stress. And particularly if you're seeing these as different from your baseline point of reference, say before the pandemic. That's not to say that many of us weren't already experiencing maybe some overwhelming levels of stress, but we really think about with some of these behavioral and physical signs a change relative to a previous point of reference. So I'm not expecting you to read what's in the background here. This is actually just a useful resource that you can access on your own if you're interested from the National Institute of Mental Health. You can see the link to their website and this brochure down at the bottom, five things that you should know about stress. And to just summarize some of the important points, stress affects everyone, not all stress is bad. Long-term stress can be harmful. There are ways that you can take control and manage your stress and professional help and free nationwide resources are also available. So when we think about stress management, we think about identifying and putting in place preferred coping strategies. Each of us typically has ways that we can cope with or mitigate the impact of stress in our lives. So we wanna think about, for example, before the COVID-19 pandemic, what did you do to manage your stress? So some people might say, well, you know, I hung out with my friends, I went to dinner with my friends, I went to the gym, I can't do either of those things now. Well, fair enough, but I think it's important to think about, is there a modified version of that? Can you have Zoom meetups with your friends, for example? Can you have uh, online exercise opportunities, even online exercise meetup groups? So again, one of the things that's important about identifying coping strategies is thinking about what has worked for you in the past, thinking about new alternative options, think about, about modifications of protocols that are hard in the context of social or physical distancing, but come up with something that you know has the potential to reduce your stress. And again, this may be something that works for you and doesn't work for your friends or neighbors. So this is a highly indiv individualized stress management plan. Basic stress management also just typically includes some mechanism for exercise, good nutrition, adequate sleep, a plan for downtime, realistic expectations, setting realistic expectations about what's achievable, again, what is within your control and what is not. Um, oftentimes positive reframing is encouraged. So positive reframing can include um, thinking about things that are working in your life currently that you may be grateful for despite the ongoing and perhaps obvious or even seemingly overwhelming challenges that are associated with the current circumstances. Social connection and use of humor. Um, you know, use of humor, we see this a lot with memes and particularly among adolescents and early adults, but I think that for all of us, uh, the use of humor can be an extremely important tool to mitigate our stress. So on this next slide, Oh, I apologize, advancing the slides sometimes is a little sticky. Um, so on this next slide, on the left-hand side, you can see the World Health Organization has put out this infographic around coping with stress during COVID-19. And this infographic has actually been adapted um, you know, across many different countries and to local community needs. But essentially, there are a few key elements that have stayed the same. One is, validating that it is normal to feel sad, stressed, confused, scared, or angry at this time. Two is, to the extent possible, it's important to engage with others and talk about your feelings. Again, some of the stress management things I mentioned around proper diet, sleep, exercise, social contacts, minimizing use of alcohol or drugs as a mechanism for coping. And also an important point that I, that I wanna emphasize we know that timely, accurate, and credible information, particularly in a crisis, is associated with positive mental health outcomes. However, we also know that excessive exposure to media is associated with poor mental health outcomes during a crisis. So what I would encourage you is to think about a couple reputable sources of information for me, that is the World Health Organization and the CDC, among others, some research and other platforms, uh, the Colorado School of Public Health, 
and know that you're going to look to those sources for credible, accurate information. It's also timely as the situation evolves, whatever your preferred and credible sources are. And at the same time, make sure that your own media exposure is limited, that you're not indiscriminately exposing yourself throughout the day to an excessive amount of media around COVID-19. You might say, uh, set aside you know, time in the afternoon or in the morning to check the news. Um, then on the right-hand side here, we have a couple of things that you're gonna see, you know, this pattern is repeated across infographics and self-care materials and in different contexts and different settings. This idea about excessive exposure to media, connecting with others, time to set aside for stress relief. If you go over to the blue bubble, you'll see that this is actually focused on just in brief, and we can talk more about this in the Q&A uh, as some of you may like, how do we talk to children during this time and how do we support children during this time? And there's a few basic principles, reassuring them, them that they're safe, letting them talk about their worries and not shutting them down, sharing your own coping skills or coping strategies and encouraging them to identify and utilize their coping skills, their preferred skills, and limiting their news exposure. And when they do have media exposure, and of course this varies by the developmental level of the child, when they do have media exposure, say, okay, we're going to talk about this. I'm going to help you understand and unpack this. And again, being aware of what type of media they're being exposed to. Also importantly, to the extent possible, creating a routine and a structure. During times of crisis, it's often reassuring for children at all age levels to have some predictability in their day. So predictability and to the extent possible, maintaining our own mental health and well-being as parents will, uh, I mean, that's an important piece, I guess, is what I want to say. I don't want to unduly burden anyone to feel that you can't be struggling with your own mental health needs at this time. But I do want to emphasize that to the extent that you can manage your own mental health needs, that will directly have a positive impact on your children. Think about self-care as a way of helping your children and others and your family as well. So this is a screenshot of several apps that can be used for mental health support. There are many, many more. These are just a few that I chose to highlight. So let me first draw your attention, left-hand bottom corner, MindShift. MindShift is a mental health app designed specifically for teens and young adults struggling with anxiety. This is an excellent app. Um, when we go over to the right-hand side, you'll see at the top, self-help for anxiety management. Most of these are geared towards adults, but you know, teens and children can utilize as well. For example, going down, we see Calm. This is an app that's um, an excellent mental health app to mitigate, manage stress and anxiety with guided meditation, sleep stories, breathing, prop, uh, breathing programs. So um, again, you know, linked or not to meditation frameworks, relaxing music. I've used this app myself and I've also used it with my nine-year-old daughter. And on the bottom, Talkspace Online Therapy. This is just one of a number of online platforms where you can access telemental health services, either through live video, recorded video, or text. Um, and then you see on the left-hand side, back up at the top, we have Happify, uh, psychologist-approved mood training program, if you need a happy fix, a fast track to a good mood, then going down, cognitive behavioral therapy and acceptance commitment therapy methods to help you cope with depression, anxiety, stress, and more. Again, these are just a, a sort of menu of a few options. This is a growing space in terms of uh, mental health and self-help apps, as well as telemental health offerings. So when we're talking about coping strategies, of course, we have to emphasize that coping strategies include engaging with and growing your social support networks. So you hear a lot about social distancing, but let's instead talk about physical distancing, not social distancing. We are now more social than ever, particularly because there are so many social platforms available. So I think it's important that we think about how to engage in a creative way with these types of initiatives. 
So before we go on to some specific creative examples, and I would encourage you to think about your own creative examples of how to stay socially connected at a physical distance. Before we go on to that, I wanna emphasize why this is so important. We know that there are detrimental effects of social isolation and loneliness. So there's some interesting articles, blogs, other things floating around the internet and elsewhere asking, what do you wanna do when this is over? What's the first thing that you'll do when all of this is over? What do you miss the most? And often people are talking about when this is over being, you know, some of these uh, movement restrictions and physical or social distancing protocols, right? And I can encourage, you know, each of you to think about what your answer to this question might be. I can tell you that many people in their response to this question or some version of this question respond with answers emphasizing social activities and physical connection. For example, hug my mom. Now this isn't surprising because we know that social isolation is associated with increased morbidity and mortality, coronary heart disease and stroke, poor mental health. For those of you that are interested in learning more, uh, this resource on the bottom right hand side is useful as well as the clickable links here. Social isolation, when we use this terminology, social isolation includes both objective social isolation, so the actual lack of social ties, and subjective social isolation, the feeling of a lack of engagement with others. And it's important that we think about these two as somewhat separate. So for example, you can be objectively, socially, or physically isolated, but not feel a sense of loneliness. And you may be objectively connected to others, but still feel lonely. So feelings of social connection and perception of social support is really quite critical. And there is a, a growing body of research that suggests that social support is a robust predictor of positive mental health outcomes. And at the same time, a lack of su social support is seen as a risk factor for poor mental health outcomes. But, so the social connectedness piece is really critical in this discourse around mental health and well-being. And the social connectedness has become increasingly challenging in the context of some of the restrictions associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's think about how we can encourage social connection while being physically distant. For any interest, hobby, or need, there is likely to be an online group. It's relatively easy to connect if you're willing to put yourself out there. Um, I actually thought this article on the left-hand side was really creative. You can access it through the link with the slides that you'll receive later. 57 things to do with friends while social distancing beyond catching up. Time to get creative with all those Zoom calls. So this is something that I would encourage you to access and look through this list. And of course, not all 57 will resonate for everyone, but even if you know eight or 10 of them resonate for you, great, that might give you some creative ideas about strategies that you haven't tried. There are a lot of exciting and compelling and potentially useful online support groups as well. And always when we talk about remote social engagement, the issue of social media comes up. So some of you may prefer Facebook, others YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, WhatsApp, Snapchat, Facebook Messenger, WeChat, Google Hangouts, and more. But, and of course, the ubiquitous Zoom. But when we think about the social media platforms, we're really sort of talking about that kind of historical uh, Facebook and similar mechanisms where you could actually passively engage uh, with, say, a feed and scroll through. So passive engagement with social media platforms in both adults and teenagers may actually be associated with adverse mental health outcomes in some of the research. Uh, well, it has been in some of the research, and we're you know, still researching this area to understand what some of the drivers of that are. So for example, Increased time on social media may displace more authentic social experiences. Exposure to highly idealized representations of peers' lives may result in a belief that others lead happier and more successful lives. Again, we're talking about the distinction between passive and active engagement with social media. So if, for example, you use social media through Facebook to scroll 
and you know maybe comment or like or maybe just view others feed this may be potentially problematic if that's all you're doing if however you use facebook to join a support group or a group that's uh, based on your particular interests or say a group that's using uh, humorous memes to cope with the current COVID-19 pandemic and you're also contributing in that group and dialoguing back and forth with others, then these are potentially very useful and helpful ways to engage through social media in true active social connectedness. I also want to emphasize there's actually a lot happening in local neighborhoods around increased social cohesion and engagement. In some cases, we have examples of neighbors getting to know one another in the context of this pandemic when they didn't know each other at all before. So for example, the app Nextdoor, uh, this is typically for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's uh, an app that's neighborhood based where neighbors share information and resources. Right? And people might sell, you know, various items or, you know, again, there's a, there's a whole wide range of ways that people use the platform. However, um, since the pandemic, increasingly, we've seen things like what's happened with Nextdoor. They have partnered with large grocery chains to try to facilitate um, opportunities for neighbors to get groceries for other neighbors who are unable to go out, who are homebound, not just because of the social distancing protocols, but because they may be in a high risk group or maybe having other struggles. So for example, you can see these apps being used to support vulnerable or isolated people and other ways of making a positive difference in the community. Um, another way that neighborhoods have come to, together to support one another's mental health and well-being and created a sense of solidarity and social cohesion that in many cases didn't exist before the pandemic is the bear hunt. I don't know if any of you are familiar with or participated in the bear hunt. I have with my daughter in our local neighborhood. Um, many communities are displaying bears or other stuffed animals in windows and children of all ages are going around the neighborhood again at a distance, but going on a bear scavenger hunt and finding the bears. So there are lots of examples of this. For those of you that are interested in additional follow-up resources, there are lots of resources available. A few that I've highlighted here that I think are particularly useful, uh, these are Colorado and nationwide. Healthier Colorado, and that includes mental health, food assistance, utility support, child care information, and more. Mental Health Colorado, Colorado Crisis Services, National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, Disaster Distress Helpline, National Domestic Violence Hotline, and again, emphasizing that there are many opportunities for telemental health supports. Some of you, of course, I assume can check with your healthcare provider and find out what's available and what's uh, covered through your insurance plans. But it is the case that even if you aren't able to access tele telemental health services through your existing healthcare provider, you have other options. And again, going back to the slide with the app, you also have some, uh, in some cases, free peer-based support networks, in other cases, low-cost telemental health support opportunities. Also, um, for everyone, you can access the web page through the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus for the Department of Psychiatry. Um, there are really tons of resources and I've been very impressed with what they've been putting out since the beginning of this pandemic. Um, some of the resources that are available to everyone uh, through clickable links on their website include self-care toolkit for coping with social distancing, resources for kids and parents, and in other cases resources are specific to uh, CU Anschutz students or faculty or staff, so I would encourage you to reach out and ask if there's something that you're interested in, whether or not you're eligible. So for example, they have um, uh, remote social support networks for parent caregivers, grief groups for adults and adolescents. Um, they also have a series of webinars. I'm not sure about their upcoming webinars, but you can check their website. So in wrapping up and opening it up to questions, comments, and sharing, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions and I'm happy to discuss any issues that I only touched on in brief. 
that may be of interest to some of you. Uh, for example, working with children or, or teens and their mental health needs during this time. I know that, um, for example, high school seniors are, many of them are struggling with missing milestones in terms of graduation. And so thinking about how to support them and provide alternative means of uh, acknowledging those milestones and having some kind of ceremonial way of making them feel special during this time, I think is really critical. We see some creative examples of that with you know, drive-by uh, honking of the cars and celebrations or you know, virtual graduation or proms or other things, although I recognize that in some ways those might not be entirely satisfying and they're certainly not perceived by most as a substitute for the so-called real thing in person. Um, so we can chat more about that, but I also want to encourage um, those of you on this call, again, this is an incredibly diverse, heterogeneous group with, I'm sure, lots of creative ideas. So beyond what I can think of from my you know, individual vantage point, I would love to hear examples from those of you that are participating in this webinar of innovative ways that you have stayed socially connected and uh, examples of coping strategies also that you found useful during this time. And at that, uh, with that, I'll, I'll leave it there and open it up to the Q&A and comments and sharing. Thank you so much again for inviting me to contribute to this webinar series. Great. Thank you so much, Courtney. And as a reminder, any questions that you have for Courtney, please submit via Q&A or chat feature. And please let us know as well your responses to these two questions on the screen. As we wait for those responses to come in, we'll start with a question. We've been getting a lot. This is um, from Diane, this specific question. I have not been sleeping well, and I've been having a lot of active dreams um, during the pandemic. Do you have any tips for improving the quality of my sleep? This is a great question. Um, I, I believe lots of people are having difficulty sleeping and also very active dreams. There's a few things that people generally recommend to help with sleep. One is uh, cutting off social media or engaging with your phone or whatnot, you know, some period before you're planning to go to sleep. Um, also, as part of that, if you are able to actually set a routine such that you can, say, take a bath or unwind, read, have an established ritual that helps you to transition from your active, engaged day self winding down towards nighttime. I realize this isn't possible for everyone, and, and sometimes parents in particular of, of younger children find this difficult. Um, if you do try a variety of stress management techniques that have been highlighted here and that you can find in other online resources, or for example, that calming app has um, subcategories of you know, sort of sleep-inducing uh, meditation, breathing, or music options. If you try these and you're finding that this isn't effective, then I think it's important if you're having chronic um, really quite debilitating sleep difficulties that you reach out to a mental health provider. And again, to the extent possible, going through your existing health networks and talking to a primary care physician and getting a referral uh, could be useful. Because I think you know, for any mental health symptoms that people are experiencing, as symptoms become increasingly debilitating and interfere with our ability to function in work and relationship domains, this is where it's really important to think about reaching out for professional help. Thank you. I'll jump in here. We have a comment to number two here about coping strategies. Lee has shared that um, she uses the Happiness Lab podcast and she also wanted to share that there's a regular, regular mindfulness session taking place on Tuesday and Thursday through the Arapaho Public Library, and that is open to everyone. So thank you for sharing that. Lisa also shared she moved her work table to the front room so she has more natural light and she can see neighbors as well as those walking by, and that decreases her sense of isolation. Um, and then Steph has shared, she walks around in the open space by her neighborhood every day, even if she doesn't feel like it, and she always feels better after she's done that. And then Deb shares that the Calm app is free for basic services, also podcasts such as 10% Happier, which is providing a number of podcasts on coping with COVID-19, and then Unlocking Us with Brene Brown. 
So we've got some great tips there. Let's see, we'll move to another question. Question here from Phil. Can you speak to the tension that people might feel between mental health and physical health? It seems like some people are risking exposure by pursuing activities that they feel will improve their mental health. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I think that if people feel that they're being asked to make a choice between the two, that's a, you know, kind of a losing proposition always. Ideally, people can still engage in, for example, physical exercise while they may need to make some modifications. In some places, uh, people are really limited in terms of their ability to actually go outside and engage in physical exercise outdoors. Um, in other places, they are able to do it, but they're encouraged to wear a mask or a face covering. I realize that might interfere with breathing and other things, particularly if you're doing strenuous exercise. Um, for people who do have limitations in terms of going out, finding ways of exercising in their home or whatnot, um, this is really not, there's no ideal answer. Because again, if you set it up as a dichotomy, it's a losing proposition to have to choose between the two. But I would suggest that people can find a way of accommodating their mental health needs, for example, through exercise while also adhering to public health guidance. I think a lot of this is challenging because people are looking to others to understand what they should be doing at this time. And again, credible sources of information about public health guidance. And that's, that's changing and evolving all the time too. So it's, it's challenging to stay on top of that. But having access to, to credible and timely uh, sources of information is important. You know, in some cases, for example, on hiking trails and elsewhere, um, the conditions can become quite crowded and problematic. But in other cases, they're limiting the number of people on the trail so that people can safely hike while still social distancing. So I think trying to think about, you know, where is that in between point? And I realize that's, you know, it's a far from ideal situation for many people right now. Great, thank you, Courtney. And we've had a couple of additional tips coming in about connecting with others, virtual happy hour with friends. Recently, we shared pictures of ourselves as a baby and child, and we had one another guess who uh, each of the pictures belong to, which is interesting. Um, and then we also have in terms of coping strategies, you know, maintaining a morning schedule is really important. And then connecting with a friend, we watch Jeopardy live online through the ABC website at the same time, which is a really fun idea. Um, speaking of routine, we do have a question here from Stephanie. Do you have tools, Courtney, on how to best stick to a routine? Yes. Um, so I think in terms of sticking to a routine, this is a, a very personal endeavor. So some people are finding the use of uh, calendars or time management planning apps to be very useful. Others prefer you know, some kind of physical book where they can keep track of things. Um, I think that in some cases, people are being successful in delineating portions of their day so that they know that they're transitioning from work time to say time with children or relaxation time. Personally, I've used calendar apps um, and related materials effectively, but I realized that that may not be the case for everyone. I think there's also you know, there's this tension between having structure in your day and, and, and not having structure. And I think feeling the pressure to constantly adhere to a very rigorous and mutable schedule is, is not something that's particularly helpful. I think ideally trying to have structure in your day while being forgiving of yourself and building in some fluidity is crucial. Again, maybe people on the webinar have preferences in terms of time management tools or apps. Great. If you do have a preference, please let us know. And Phil also added a comment. He said, as a therapist, I have been encouraging my clients to create artificial commutes to separate work and school time by building in rituals that occur before and after those activities, which is great. Um, great idea. I know that you've covered teens to some extent. We talked about those milestones. Karen's wondering, could you share more about how to support adolescents that we have in our lives, in our homes, or even at a distance um, serving in a teacher role? 
Sure. I mean, I think there's a lot in there. So there's two pieces I hear in that. One is to acknowledge that many of us, myself included, are inhabiting multiple roles right now. And that may have always been the case for us, but we may not have inhabited those roles simultaneously and in the same living space. So that is challenging. For example, you know, teachers that are teaching remotely and at the same time, they're trying to manage the needs of themselves and their family and ongoing things in the household, maybe with uh, their spouse or others who are also working remotely simultaneously. So I just want to acknowledge that this is particularly challenging to be inhabiting multiple roles simultaneously. And for many of us, we may feel that our workload has actually increased, but our productivity has decreased. Um, and again, going back to stress response, challenges with decision making, concentration, forgetfulness, and other things may also be a contributing factor, as well as all these sort of simultaneous responsibilities pulling us in different directions. In terms of the other part of that question, um, for teens and, and even for younger children, you know, some of what we've talked about still holds, helping them to think about an individual stress management plan, helping them to identify coping skills, helping them to identify what are their behavioral and physical manifestations of stress. How can they tell when they're feeling stressed? And then thinking about creative ways of helping them to stay socially engaged and also to maintain some semblance of structure in their day. For example, um, yesterday a colleague of mine shared with me that her teenage daughter had a daily ritual where she would go outside and in her neighborhood they were having porch dance parties. Um, and again, you know, connecting uh, socially in ways that maybe in some ways feel inadequate compared to in-person, but in other ways are actually about growing new social networks. Um, my daughter has actually engaged in new activities since the COVID-19 pandemic and the stay-at-home orders and has engaged with new friends that she didn't have any contact with previously. And so I think that if we're innovative and we think on behalf of ourselves and our children, we might be able to facilitate some of this simultaneously for ourselves and other family members. Great, thank you for that. I wanted to add that Eva has added for coping strategies, identify and be mindful of moments of feelings of contentment, such as a pretty sunrise or that first sip of coffee um, in the morning. And then we're going to move into our final two questions here. One question is from Chelsea. What do you think of the pressure of self-improvement during this difficult time? Is it enough to just cope? Absolutely, absolutely. It, it is more than enough to just get through. Um, I think that again, going back to that earlier slide, acknowledging that all of us are coming from very different vantage points, very different starting points, very different life circumstances at this time. Um, that's one of the challenges of doing a webinar like this. And for some, they may be experiencing enhanced productivity and opportunities to write more or whatnot. Um, for example, research colleagues of mine, some of them are finding that they're able to submit more manuscripts, but others of us, myself included, I think are seeing an increase in our workload and a decrease in our productivity. And to the extent that we're able to um, put things on pause and recalibrate our expectations, downward revision of expectations so that they're more realistic, what does it look like for me working at 30% productivity relative to my usual baseline? And then how am I going to structure my week if I have the luxury of doing this in such a way that I can meet those milestones but not, you know, castigate myself for not meeting my typical weekly milestones in terms of achievements and outcomes and outputs. So yes, I think especially in the early weeks of the social distancing and stay at home, there was a lot of pressure on, uh, put on a, many of us around this issue of like increased productivity and opportunities to do things while at home. Uh, for example, you know, learn a second language. That's great. Those of you that are learning a second language, power to you. I am not currently having the bandwidth to accommodate that. Okay, 
Great, thank you for that. And we'll end with this question from Doug. What if any positive mental health impacts might the pandemic create? Yeah, this is a great question. I, I touched on this a little bit uh, earlier in the presentation. I think we are seeing um, increase in social cohesion, solidarity, um, growing of social networks, in some cases, an increased awareness of others and particularly those that may be um, isolated at home, that may be you know, older community members or community members with medical challenges. I think there are people with vulnerabilities that are um, maybe being acknowledged in some neighborhoods and communities and supported in ways that they may not have been before the pandemic. Um, I think that it's also important to think about, um, you know, again, this is an individual journey for each of us. And then there's also potentially a journey that families are on. And so for some during this time, families may become closer, um, relationships may strengthen. There may be a whole range of positive mental health outcomes for individuals. The, the sense of efficacy and accomplish, accomplishment in getting through a difficult time. That having been said, um, that doesn't negate the reality that for so many, there is so much difficulty and suffering. And so I, I think that on a society, societal level, there are potential positive outcomes. And on an individual level, there are potential positive outcomes. And we just need to acknowledge that all of this may be happening simultaneously. Thank you. Great reminder as we end the presentation. And I want to say thank you so much to everyone for joining us for today's presentation. And thank you again to Courtney for this great information. As a reminder, all webinar attendees will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this presentation. To view upcoming webinars as well as previous recordings, please visit our website at colorado.edu slash business slash alumni. We hope that you will join us for our next webinar, which is tomorrow, as the Lead School of Business's Dr. Rich Wabakin shares an update on the economic outlook for both Colorado and the national economies. In the meantime, have a great rest of your day and go Buffs! <laughs>